table, there's uh, grilled pork chops and chicken. So here's the chicken. to see you. It's always nice to have this opportunity for us to meet and uh, share with each other. Um, I won't be long before you tonight. I just want to share with you a few updates from the, uh, from the county's perspective. And you do have uh, a copy of my presentation at your seat. Um, tonight, is, well, for a few minutes, I want to talk about some notable accomplishments um, got many, but I just want to share a few with you tonight. I want to talk about some important initiatives, priorities for next fiscal year, and then certainly I'll offer opportunity for you to ask any questions that you might have. So first in regards to um, 
notable accomplishments. So I see it as an accomplishment, us weathering this workforce storm. And I'm sure you all have been going through it. It seems like everybody, every company, public, private, has been facing the uh, workforce challenges here lately. Uh, we certainly have been doing everything we possibly can do to weather that and to not just survive it, but to hopefully thrive through it. And we've uh, employed a few um, strategies to try to deal with that. Uh, first of all, we've made some investments in technology. I want to recognize uh, Jason Webb, who is our Chief Information Officer. He certainly uh, led the charge in a number of these initiatives in the last couple of years. We've made investments to switch over to Office 365 for all of our staff. Uh, we've uh, totally changed over our phone system to a voice over IP phone system. Uh, we've uh, made investments in audiovisual equipment and several of our meeting spaces in the building, all to, because COVID and these staffing shortages have, have uh, demanded more flexibility and mobility from all of us. I'm sure all of us have had to learn to do some new things as it relates to technology that we never thought we'd have to do before. We had to learn uh, pretty quickly. Um, also, um, we had to rethink work. You know, we are so used to, you know, as, as everyone, you know, used to doing business the same way we've always been doing business. Our citizens are used to us providing all of our services from our office or workspace or what have you. But because of the demands of the workforce and, uh, you know, high turnover, we had to rethink that. And so we had to uh, open ourselves to reconsider how and where that our team members could do their jobs. Now, certainly there are a lot of things that we do in county government that you just have to be there to do, right? Um, but we looked for every opportunity that we could where jobs could be either totally transitioned to remote or at least some hybrid version of that. So not a tremendous number of employees, but out of about 550 employees, right now we've got about 24 or 25 of our staff members that work from home, either totally or some hybrid version. And just, you know, where we are in the workforce forced us to have to rethink um, how we work and, and where we do that work from. Um, we've also, in the job market being so competitive, of course, we would love to have said, we're just going to give everybody a 10, 15% raise so we don't lose a single employee, but that's just not possible, right? So we've had to look for uh, creative ways to try to uh, put some incentives out there to try to, uh, you know, to, to hire and retain good qualified staff. And so one of the things, a few things we've done is uh, we, we've tried to reward growth um, in, in our staff. So uh, what we're doing is what we call credential incentives, where if in a particular position, there is a verifiable, bona fide, takes a little sweat to get it kind of credential. Um, it's not just a two or three hour, you know, quick online class you take and they email your certificate. I mean, you really got to put some time into it and it's a verifiable credential. Then we've been looking for ways to reward that. So we've been able to do that in a number uh, of our departments. And so that that is not totally uh, shut the floodgates, but it's helped to slow that down a little bit. And that's just one of the few things we're doing. Um, also, we had to revisit our purpose. You know, after all of us trying to do our jobs in the midst of COVID, and I don't know about y'all, but it seems like the public is a little bit more on edge than they used to be, and sometimes you know, a few of them are not as friendly, and the work just gets harder and harder. Individually, employees are asking, why am I doing this? You know, why, why am I even putting myself through this? And the pay is not where I want it to be, and maybe I should do something else. Well, not only as individuals do we have to, you know, we have that thought, but as an organization, we had to rethink that. We had to rethink and consider uh, our why. You know, why is it that we you know, put so much energy and time and effort into the things that we do to serve our citizens? provide the services that, that we provide. And so we, as an organization, we, we've thought through the why, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, 
in just a few minutes. But overall, I, I list this as a as a success because we we weathered it. In fact, you should celebrate yourself too because you've weathered it too, right? It's been a very difficult last two or three years, but we're still here, right? Uh, we're still providing services. You know, we never stop providing services, and though we've been short staffed. You know, we've never, you know, it's like trying to balance all of those plates. You know, a few have gotten wobbly over the last couple of years, but we've not dropped any very serious ones anyway. And so, uh, you know, I think that's something that we need to celebrate. Certainly we do uh, that as an organization. In fact, I feel confident in saying that not only have we come through this, I think we as an organization have come through this strongly. And we are, we are really retooling and repositioning ourselves as an organization based on some of the things that the lessons that we've learned in the last couple of years. Um, also, uh, in the last year, you hear about Kingsborough Industrial Park, I think every time, it's not because it's the only thing we got to talk about, but it is a big thing in Edgecombe County. It's a, not just a big thing in Edgecombe County, it is a big thing in the state of North Carolina. This is a big deal, Kingsborough Industrial Park. And I bring that up again because we have continued to build on the value of our business part, to build on its attractiveness. One of the ways that we've been able to do that is to continue to grow and improve the infrastructure that's available there. We've had water and sewer there for a long time, and you know, there's been internet access in and around it for a long time, and now we have a you know a service road that runs through it that's named after our chairman, Mr. Leonard Wiggins. And, you know, so we got off, but every year we try to do a little something and we're pursuing grant opportunities. Uh, federal COVID funding provided us great opportunities for that and we try our best to take advantage of that. Uh, we received, we've been approved for a couple of grants. One grant is to increase our water capacity um, out at the park. So once that work is complete, there is, very few businesses that would look that could locate out there that their demand for water would be so big that we we couldn't provide it. We can provide a lot of water out in that park once this is done. We're also working on trying to secure funding to increase our sewer capacity. Our goal is that every time we sit down and talk with a prospect, no matter what they make or if they plan to make, no matter how big they might be. We want, as they go down that checklist, asking those questions, do you have this, do you have that, can you do this, can you do that? We want to be able to say yes to every one of those questions. And right now, really, the only one that we can't quite say yes to is on the sewer side. We can provide lots of sewer, but if, if that whole park were to fill up tomorrow, we could not provide sewer for all of them. So we continue to build out uh, our infrastructure there um, at Kingsborough. Right now, we have a total site control of, of right at 2,000 acres. Um, through some ARPA funds, we we're able to close off some purchase agreements there. And so uh, on the map that you probably more clearly see at your place, um, we actually own, uh, let's see, I don't know if that'll show up there, but that road running uh, north-south there is intersecting that 64 bypass, that's Kingsborough Road. The county owns everything uh, to the east of 64 bypass. Uh, Carolines Gateway has an option on the land to the west of it, but the county owns everything that's shown up there um, in the topo map, everything east of uh, Kingsborough Road. So uh, that's something that we're very excited about. Um, we also, you know, because of this, we have been very appealing in particular to EV or electric vehicle related companies. Whether it be companies that manufacture batteries for electric vehicles or manufacture the whole car. Right now, we've got four active projects that are looking at Kingsborough Industrial Park that are EV related. Whereas, you'll recall a few years ago, we thought we had landed at Triangle Tire, and of course, eventually they pulled the plug on that. Triangle Tire pulled the plug on that. That project uh, was uh, about $800 million of investment and we were like, this is changing the life of Edgecombe County forever. These projects start at a billion dollars and go north. We just got a new prospect last week. It's very early, so I 
try to manage my excitement about these things. But they are talking about first phase, $4 billion. The calculator on my phone won't calculate that high. $4 billion. All of them are around 1,000 jobs plus, some of them 2,000 jobs plus. So because we are so ready at Kingsborough, we are very attractive to these types of companies. Because all of them are off to the races. They're trying to capitalize on where they think the market is going to go. And they're looking for a place where they can be to production as quickly as possible. And we can offer that at Kingsborough better than any part anywhere in the state of North Carolina. Also, QVC, as you know, we had the unfortunate fire there uh, a couple of years ago almost. Uh, but in recent months, um, the, uh, the fire damage portion of that facility has been totally clean, cleaned off, cleared out. And now, uh, if you look at it, it looks like a concrete pad that just got pulled. And so there are two parts of the building, the building to the left and the building to the far back that are still standing. They're doing some renovations to it. And it is ready for somebody to move in and build something to start manufacturing something. You probably read in the newspaper a few months ago Ownership of the building recently changed hands. There's a new owner, it's an owner investor, um, who purchased that building. And now we have two prospects that are looking at that building. So some exciting things going on at, at Kingsbury. Um, one of our other accomplishments of the last year or so has been our strategic investment of our ARPA funds, or American Rescue Plan Act funds. And I know, I think, I'm pretty sure y'all can relate to this. You know, when the when the federal government just calls you up and says, hey, we're getting ready to send you $10 million. And by the way, we're going to send you half of it. We haven't even finished writing the rules on it. And then we want you to have to spend it. But don't spend it the wrong way, because then five years from now, we're going to come back and we're going to audit your books. You know, so it's a blessing, but it's also a burden, right? So we got just under ten million dollars, and we had a we had a, a very difficult decision as to how we're going to spend it because you can only spend it once. And I'm grateful for our board and the work that they did with us as a staff in our decision making how we were going to strategically invest this money that we can only spend once. We sort of looked at it from three perspectives. We said, how can we spend this to help the people? How can we spend it to help the county, us as an organization? And how can we spend this for the future as well? So we came up with, uh, um, with a plan as to how we were going to uh, spend that fund, those funds. And so uh, as far as the people, we, we are offering uh, some supportive services for the elderly through our Office on Aging. Uh, we have a crisis intervention program that we ran through our Department of Social Services. In fact, um, of $250,000, we've spent that down to uh, just over $500. We have assisted 535 families with uh, different types of assistance, whether it's rental assistance, utility assistance, and a number of different things. Uh, right now, we're still taking applications for uh, what we call an urgent home repair program. So those are the programs that we stood up uh, to help um, as it relates to the county, our objective was how we might invest some of this money internally was to first of all provide some short-term budget relief for us, but at the same time to address a long-term capital need. So you'll see the list. I won't read everything there, but we satisfy some obligations that we still owed at Kingsboro and a site uh, prep work out there put some money in, in our payroll and a few other things. We did hazard bonuses. We're doing some capital improvements now. Capital improvements that otherwise we would either have had to save up for a few years or borrow some money. So um, we're very happy how we were able to invest those funds. And then finally for the future, broadband. So the board has decided that of just under $10 million, that we're going to set aside a million dollars to invest in the advancement and deployment of broadband in the county. Um, this is going to be leveraged alongside four million dollars of state funds through the Great Grant Program. Um, so our company Brightspeed just found out recently they were awarded funds uh, to help expand broadband opportunities in the county. The board 
is going to continue to explore opportunities, whether we work with that company or do something outside of that. But between our million and their four million, we feel like that we can help to invest in broadband access getting to anywhere from an additional two to 3,000 households in Edgecombe County. So uh, we're excited about that. You know, that's a very complicated thing. None of us are broadband experts other than being a really good end user, right? I use a lot of internet service. Uh, none of us are experts, so we are together learning as we go. And we're trying to inform ourselves to make good decisions, but uh, we've been excited about that opportunity. Uh, quickly, I want to mention a few um, important initiatives uh, that we've been looking at. I mentioned a moment ago, you know, we had to take a step back and, and sort of look within ourselves and ask ourselves the why. You know, why why are we doing this? What 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 is our purpose? What's what's our vision? So. Um, our staff, some of our staff and the board at their retreat spent some time looking at that, looking at what's our vision for our county, from the perspective of our citizens, what's the vision for us as an organization. And so through several sessions, a lot of hard work, we whittled down some really good feedback to, uh, to what we call a two-sided vision statement. So the vision for our county now, this is our new vision statement, is that Edgecombe County is a historic place that values its citizens and natural resources and creates opportunities where people are proud to live, work, and play for generations to come. That sounds like a place I'd like to live. And the other side of that vision statement is for us as an organization. If that's what we want our county to be, then who do we have to be as an organization to help our county to get there? So this is the side of our vision statement that faces in and so as an organization, we value our employees so that it can be an organization committed to providing exceptional services to our citizens through an innovative, passionate, and creative team uh, devoted to excellence, integrity, and transparency for the continued growth of our county and staff. That sounds like a place I would want to work in. So we're, we're excited about that. We are uh, not, just, not just doing that to have, you know, vision statements to put up on the wall so we can say we've got one. This is something that we are keeping in front of us and, and allowing it to drive budget decisions, allowing it to drive management decisions, allowing it to drive how we invest money for the future. So you're going to be seeing and hearing a lot more about that. But we need something to drive us, right? We need something to motivate us to go from where we are to where we need to be. It's like building a bridge. And so uh, you know, reaching back uh, to the legacy of the former manager, Mr. Lorenzo Carmen, who used to say, I'm tired of being at the top and bottom of every bad list, right? He used to uh, tell us that. Many of us had the opportunity to work with him. I was honored to work with him for 14 years before he retired. He used to tell us that all the time. So we've taken that sentiment and we've whittled it down to our call to action, which simply is get off the list. Right? And there are lots of lists. We either want to get off it, move down it, move up it, but something about these lists that Hitchcomb County finds itself being on, we want to affect those lists. So we're doing a lot of work. We've really rolled up our sleeves on this. We've got a group that just met a few weeks ago, sort of a strategic visioning group. That's some of our stakeholders that are joining us. We're doing work internally with our staff, work with the board. So this is something that you'll hear from us more as well. Um, so some other things we're doing, um, one of the lists that we have to be on is that we have, we are usually in the top five highest unemployment rates in the state. And I've been working with the county for, uh, for 21 years, and it seems like we've always been in the top five. Oftentimes we're number one or two. Every now and then we'll slip down to six or seven as soon as we start celebrating and we go back to top five. So we're working on a suite of initiatives to help impact that in the long term. And so these are some things that uh, I won't say a whole lot about tonight because i got to roll this out to our board at our budget work session on, uh, on Thursday, on Wednesday. Uh, but I just want all of you to know that we're working on some initiatives that it's just not going to be a, a one-year thing, a one-time thing. We're trying to, to do some work to plant some trees, right, that 20 years from now somebody will be able to stand under and find some shade. And so uh, we're gonna, you're going to hear more about uh, 
some initiative that will fall under this umbrella that we're calling uh, edge cone first. Um, broadband deployment, I've talked about that a moment ago. I realized when I picked that picture that I sh that should be a laptop sitting in front of that little girl, right? So this is, you know, this is an outdated picture right now. <laughs> That's just what they got now when they get from That's right, that's right. So she's got to use that notebook because she doesn't have internet at home, right? Uh, so that's, that's part of the future, that's part of this work, you know, there's very few things that we can do without access to broadband, right? So that's part of the work that we're going to be doing as well. Uh, briefly, I just want to mention that um, as uh, part of our priorities, our board at their retreat a couple of months ago, went through a couple exercises just to get feedback from them as to, you know, we can't do it all. We don't have enough money to do everything. But what are, what is, what's most important to you? And these are four things that the board shared with us. First one being compensation plan overhaul. We are working on overhauling our compensation plan. And I say that intentionally because it's not just a market study, though we needed that. We've not done one in almost 10 years. Um, but it's not just that, it's really uh, overhauling the structure of our pay system and our, our job titles and all of that to modernize a lot of that, to, to really realign our structure. So it's a tremendous amount of work. Um, we're, we're trying to get that done in time enough to hopefully build that into the budget for next year uh, because we've got to do something. We, we're, we're losing a lot of employees. Um, we lose a lot of employees that hate to leave. We have people that tell us quite often, say, you know, I, I don't want to go, but, you know, gas, eggs, and rent, and everything else, and I just can't ignore that anymore. We have people tell us that all the time. So, you know, we're limited in what, in, in our resources, Kevin, so we can only do so much, but I really appreciate our board that they have clearly made this a priority. They've made our employees a priority, and I appreciate that. And it's not just because we got great folks working for us and this is an awesome organization. But, you know, in, as we stand right now in the Department of Social Services, we've got 174 positions on the books. And we've got a 45 plus or minus vacancies and changes from day to day. Ms. Um, Betty Battle, our director, is doing a great job. Her team is doing a great job. And they are covering the bases. They're making sure that they do what they need to do, but they are holding on to it by, by the tips of their fingernails. And so that's just one example, but you know, we see that played out throughout our organization. So we're working on compensation plan overhaul. They've also said that public safety to include sheriff, EMS, and fire is a priority. Education and workforce is a priority, as well as economic growth as it has always been. So, uh, just a few things I want to share with you tonight. Again, it's my honor to be here, and certainly I'm open to ask, answer any questions if you have any, uh, if I can. Tonight we'll be discussing uh, the budget request for National Public Schools. I would like to first thank the commissioners for their support and their presence tonight. Your support has allowed for some great accomplishments this year, and tonight we're going to highlight some of those accomplishments. I'd like to recognize first my cabinet and staff back there. If you would stand, please be back there. I just want to thank you for your hard work. I'm going to give you a real clap. I'm going to go over to them and tonight when they present. They'll go over there in certain areas. If you have any questions, just make sure you just you could ask them then since they're already up here. So,
briefly what it, the agenda tonight is the welcome. We're going to have a review of the last year, this year. We're going to go over the budget. We're going to talk about challenges and then requests. And at this time, completed projects by Shannon Page. Slide. We started several years ago with the high schools. We worked out toward middle schools, renovating high school gymnasiums, bleachers, uh, sand and refinished floors. We worked through the middle schools, and, and finally, the last couple of years, we've started working on the elementary schools. Uh, this past year, you can see D.S. Johnson. Uh, we replaced all the floor tile with a new seam, um, it's a welded seam floor, so a lot of low maintenance floors. Uh, we, we completed D.S. Johnson, you can see Baskerville Elementary School, these floors were original floors, they were asbestos floor tiles, they were all intact, not a safety issue, but uh, it was time to update those floors as we were trying to complete all of the, the elementary uh, floors in Inglewood Elementary. So we completed three floors this past year, covered elementary, being the last one that's in this upcoming fiscal year uh, uh, of flowing renovation. Completed roofing projects. Picture you're looking at on the left is Southern Ash High School, it's a 400 building. Uh, that's the completion of a single membrane uh, roof. That roof was 20 plus years old and extended its life. Bailey Elementary School, the canopy, of course, was, was about 18. And National High School uh, 2001, we're in phase two this past year, and phase three will be completed in this upcoming uh, fiscal year in roof cross roofing projects. When the replacements, a lot of this funding was through the ESSER funding. Um, we're really proud of updating without the ESSER, without the ESSER money, there was no way with the cost of window projects would we have ever been able to what we have accomplished uh, in the district. Uh, what you're seeing on the left is Edwards Middle School, the far left, and I'm not sure if you can even see this corner, or the older windows, and then to the right of the newer double insulated windows. Uh, Cooper's Pre-K was also completed, Spring Hill Elementary, we did the four classroom building, along with Southern Ash Middle School, the 200, 300, uh, 500, and 600 wings. And of course, Rocky Mountain Middle, we completed some of the gymnasium where we've had leaks over the past few years. What you're seeing here is on the left side of the middle school, we had uh, added a thousand linear footage of uh, paying for staffing where we had a, a lot of issues uh, with congestion out on, on Highway 43 and there in the, in the Red Oak area. The right side, you can see, is National Central Middle. We completed this uh, over spring break where they're starting the development uh, behind the school that's, that's going to end up being uh, quite a few houses, and they were not wanting us to stack our traffic out on Highway 58 or along the, the adjacent street. We did this in-house over spring break. We're paving it between now and the end of this fiscal year. This is an HVAC project we're doing in house at Spring Hope Elementary Phase One. Of course, this is also completed with extra funds, but completed with in-house projects. Uh, this is the VRF system that I've been talking about for several years. Uh, we first piloted this at DS Johnson uh, five years ago on the 100, 200, and the 300 wings. Uh, the only thing that does not have it at Johnson or the, the cafeteria dining room, they have package systems that were replaced as well. But this is a new system that's very energy efficient. Uh, we're saving on average 30 plus percent uh, in energy savings. Uh, 
uh, upon using this, and uh, we sent several of our HVAC people to school to uh, to training on, on working on this on these this type of system. It was originally used, and I, I will give a little background again in, in hospitals, and it's Japanese technology, but it's slowly migrating to the educational side. And, uh, we took we took the I guess the jump to try it in the education facility, and everywhere we teachers are really pleased with control of each type. This is the picture that which is well. This is a total renovation. I just mentioned we completed all the windows in the entire campus. Uh, mechanically, uh, we should be finishing that on the, on the right side. You're looking at the media center. That's the last day. We've been working on this project for roughly 18 months now. It's been a, about a three, three and a half million dollar project with windows and mechanical. Uh, the, the principal has been very gracious moving kids around. We've been doing this entire project uh, with in-house force as well as contractors uh, moving kids around to complete this. So it, uh, hopefully it's coming to an end before we actually test it. Uh, in the next couple of weeks we'll be getting all the COs on, on this project. Finally, you can see this many ceilings. If you've ever been at Edwards, they had all the open ceilings. You can see all the all the piping, all the boiler, the children's, and now you've got all the open ceilings throughout, all the LED lighting. Uh, hopefully, within the next 12 months, starting July, we should hopefully start reaping the, the benefits of all of the energy savings. So we'll be able to capture a 12 month and see exactly pulling boilers and children's offline what the, what the full savings will be. Uh, and the payback of, of, of this full renovation. Finally, we've got some, some projects that are currently in progress. Of course, you know we've been talking about Red Oak Elementary School. This is a rendering of the project that started from the architects. This is a picture from about a week and a half ago. Uh, the, the building is basically complete. I think we got CO on the final piece, the 600, which is the back of the gymnasium uh, last week. The, the part you're seeing up front here is the serpentine line. That's, that's the existing old campus that's been demolished, and that'll be the new car stacking line. And you see the water tower in the background. We're planning on keeping that renovated and painted, and that will fall in, in one of the lanes, uh, the island with the serpentine. And finally, the Northern Nashville House. This is something that uh, we have just, uh, in the last two weeks, put back out for bid. We originally bid this last March. Uh, bids come in uh, way over. And as Mr. Evans had mentioned, the, the climate of, of everything that has been going on, prices have increased. Uh, we didn't have the funding to move forward with the contract just due to labor costs and all the increasing costs in general. Uh, we have since, uh, hopefully, figured out means of, of funding this project. The bids will be open uh, the 23rd of May, and hopefully we should be able to secure the funding to award the contract. Of course, this is another rendering of the, the front entrance of, of the field house. Any questions for me? Phase one of this campus uh, is roughly about twenty thousand dollars. Children, the bigger of the two children, the, the phase one. You know, this campus was built in two phases. And then we have two children. That 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 money is in the next fiscal year budget. And there's some carpeting, a little bit of carpeting needs as well in the next fiscal year budget. But mechanically, we have basically touched all four of these schools, and they're mechanically in as good a shape as.
Good evening. I'm pleased uh, to stand before you this evening to go over our proposed, uh, proposed um, budget for 23-24. Um, this first slide uh, represents a summary of our proposed revenues reflecting the multiple funds that we manage, our state public school fund, our local current expense, capital outlay, child nutrition fund, and our donations and grants fund. The donation and grants fund is uh, fondly known as Fund 8 uh, to us. The one fund that is not represented on this slide is our federal fund. These projections are either based on our estimates and projections or information that we've received from the Department of Public Instruction for our state public school fund. Our federal grants don't typically come to us until around October. So that's why that's not included in, in this. As you see, our total proposed revenues for the 2324 at this point, exclusive of the federal uh, grants, is 130, a little over $138 million. This graph, graphic will just show you the percentages based on the total revenues that were in the previous slide. Um, state makes up about 73% of our total funding and local makes up about 18%. Um, if we were to factor in, our, our federal funding is somewhere in the low to mid 60, 60 million dollars, 60, 62, 63 million dollars, excuse me. So that factored in would dilute some of these numbers somewhat, but our federal funding makes up about 28% of our, of our total funding. And as you see, um, our local makes up about 18%, child nutrition about seven, and donation and grants is uh, less, less than 1%. Our current expense proposed revenue um, shows from Nash County appropriation is just slightly more than $21 million, including $400,000 for fines and forfeitures. Edgecombe County appropriation, including the differential, is just under $2.7 million, along with an estimated $40,000 for fines and forfeitures bringing the total of proposed budget to $24,938,055. I'd like to mention to you that there's been no inflation adjustment in, in our uh, projected or proposed budget, excuse me. Also, the budget was compiled based on an estimated 5% salary increases before we calculated supplements. Um, as you know, if you pay attention to the General Assembly, you'll see you know, the governor will release a budget, the House will release a budget, the Senate, I think, has just recently released a budget. Each one of those may have different amounts or projected salary increases for state employees. Um, not knowing exactly yet how this is going to shake out, um, I use 5%. Um, that may come in a little bit lower, um, depending upon once the budget is finalized. But for right now, we've projected 5% salary increases and then calculated our supplements based on those adjusted salaries. <clears throat> also, our, um, the supplements I used are paid, uh, the supplements we paid are paid to our certified staff is based on a percentage, and I used the average of the four, uh, four percentages and used 11.75% in calculating our supplements. Our retirement rate has increased 0.12%, up from 24.5% to 24.62%. And again, this is based on information that we've received from the Department of Public Instruction. Those numbers could vary somewhat as well. But um, our hospitalization rate has gone up $222 per, in, per employee. Uh, for 23, excuse me, for 22-23, uh, we're paying $7,397 per employee. Um, projected right now is 7,619 per employee, as I said, for an increase of about 2%, uh, excuse me, 3%. Our estimated effect on our, on our proposed budget of the increase in the retirement and the increase in the uh, hospitalization rate, we're projecting to affect our proposed budget about $450,000. In addition to our budget, we have factored in another $304,000 for hospitalization for international foreign teachers to fill very difficult uh, positions, to, um, to fill positions that we're having difficulty in filling, our teaching positions. Who 
is basically a summary of how Estrom County appropriation was apportioned out uh, for the 22-23 year. This could vary from year to year, but as you'll notice, the two primary uh, uh, uses of the money have been toward athletics and student activities, as well as district-wide equipment and supplies. And those two alone make up about 63%. Our capital outlay proposed revenue is just under $1.4 million. Uh, to be specific, $1,396,000 and uh, 800, excuse me, I can't read that far without glasses. I'm sorry, $1,396,890. The next three slides are simply a comparison of our beginning initial budget for 22-23 versus our proposed budget for 23-24. You may see some significant variant variances between some of these PRCs. Um, if I were to show you our current budget for 22-23, right now these numbers would be more closely aligned. But to be uh, consistent, we wanted to use the beginning budget versus the beginning budget. And the last slide is uh, Fund Aid Donations and Grants. It shows you the, our projected revenues and also how we intend to uh, expend, expend those funds. And we're projecting this, this particular fund to be $1,375,000. And these funds are those that are restricted to Nash County Public Schools, whether that be indirect cost, ROTC funds, uh, student uh, driver's ed funding, Things like this, these are funds that are specific to uh, Nash County Public Schools. Do you have any questions? Now, how can your uh, utilities be exactly the same from 2022 to 2023? Well, it's a projection, I don't know how it's going to net out exactly over the course of the but I mean, I don't know what our year to date is right now. I don't have that figure. I'll be glad to get it for you if you like. But I use basically the same number because um, as I'm, I basically use the same number for this year, for the 23-24. I'm not aware of, I've not received any indication of any significant increases in our utility rates. I have to ask the same question about charter schools. Are you not knowing? It's a proposed. It's a proposed budget. I do not have a. I don't mean this to sound a little. I don't have a, a, a crystal ball to be able to project what we're going to have. In our charter schools, we're paying for about 25 charters, 25 charter schools, and we're averaging somewhere around 1,300 students per month that we're paying for. So um, again, I use I use the same amount. Depending upon enrollment, you know how many students maybe come back to Nash. How many may leave Nash County Public Schools and go to charter schools? I understand that that number can vary. Probably not. That's the perfect person to speak on it. But the international faculty, are they in half? Are you, are those faculty coming? It might be someone else that wants to speak on that program. But is that a virtual speak to it?
say a J1 visa candidate and an H1 visa candidate. The H1B can lead to permanent residency, but we do have to fund the medical benefits for that. J1 visa is temporary, and that's why the company or agency that we partner with, that's the reason why they pay all of the benefits associated with that staff. I'm here to speak to you about ESSER funding, and this slide is going to give you an idea of going to give you an idea of the type of funding that we received over the course of the COVID years. It also gives you a breakdown of the funding that was spent and how we used it during those years. So PRC 163, which is the CARES funding. First funding that we received for COVID relief, we received approximately 4.2 million, and we did have to liquidate all funds, and that was done at the end of 2022. It also gives you a breakdown of how those funds were liquidated. So ESSER two, which is PRC 171, we have received about 950. I'm sorry, about 16 million. And we have a remaining balance of $952,000. It gives you a breakdown of how we use those funds. And we do have to liquidate all of those funds by the end of this school year. And we are on point for doing so. As the three, PRC 181, we received about $36 million. We have approximately $13 million remaining. It gives you an outline of how we have used those funds. And we do have until the end of to liquidate all of those funds, and as I stated, we are on point to ensure that we send no funding back to the federal government. Any questions about that slide? I just have one. Yes, ma'am. I understand that you, um, and after you had to do a special tutoring, can you tell me what that is on? For tutoring? So there were several components to tutoring. Um, some came in the form of CTE, some came Academically, uh, we used it pretty much to fund uh, the staffing for that, stipends for the teachers as well. Um, it would probably be more beneficial for the, someone from the instructional team to come forward, but it was outlined exactly how we could have used those funds. Any questions about that slide? My name is Leon Sarah Jr. and I'm here to present about school safety equipment and SROs. So I want to talk to you about EVOB weapons detection system. The EVOB Express Weapon Detection System combines powerful sensor, sensor technology with proven artificial intelligence, security ecosystems integration, and comprehensive venue analytics to ensure safer, more accurate threat detection in an unprecedented speed and volume. The system has a single and dual lane system. A single lane can approximately scan 200 students, excuse me, 2,000 students in an hour, 500 students in 15 minutes. Dual lanes can approximately scan 4,000 students in an hour, 500 students per lane in 15 minutes. The system, the system is 10 times faster than your regular metal detector. It's easy to be broken down, mobile. There are currently school systems in North Carolina using this system. Charlotte Neck, Guilford, Johnston, and Person counties. Pitt and Weldon and Durham have been in conversation uh, concerning this product. There are 25 school districts and charter schools throughout the country who are currently using this system. And some of those states include Virginia, Maryland, and Georgia. The 
protocol for a four-year lease on the EVAL system is as follows. There are four high schools with dual lanes and three high schools with single lanes for a four-year total cost of $929,576.16. Six middle schools with single lanes, four-year total, $673,208.26. Total four-year cost for middle and high schools, $1,602,784.27. This is a picture of a single lane. And then you have a picture of this is what I did propose. Sir, this safety equipment is what I did propose for the school system this year. For the school system for the 20, uh, 20, 23, 24 school system. So, so moving to um, SROs. receive a school safety grant for middle and elementary SROs. Nash County Public Schools is a low wealth school district and is currently in year one of a two year school safety grant that we receive for middle schools and elementary SROs. The funding is a four to one match. So we have six middle school SROs, one per school. We have eight elementary SROs, one SRO serving two schools. That is how we wrote the grant. Um, the grant allotted $50,000 to $55,000 per SRO. So the grant paid $4,000, and then the district would pay $11,000 per SRO for the difference between the total cost of each SRO. So for example, if the total cost of SROs was $68,000, the grant would pay $44,000, and the district would pick up the difference of the $24,000. school SROs funding source again is the grant I just shared with you the four to one match the state set the four to one match at $55,000.44 that they would pay $11,000 with the difference coming from the school district we have a total of eight elementary SROs that we're uh, funding eight times that $44,000 gives you $352,000 to be paid by the grant the approximate total cost for elementary school SROs, $575,000. So the approximate cost to the district for elementary SROs would be $223,000 per school year. Now that could uh, differ uh, in school years based on who the SROs are that's being hired, what agency they're working for. Uh, we know that there's an increase in cost um, for uh, SROs for law enforcement throughout the region that as they try to keep up and be competitive and keep people in the law enforcement business. So the numbers that I am sharing with you, they are not exact numbers, but these are uh, approximate numbers. Funding for middle school SROs. Again, the same um, figure when you look in terms of what the grant funding was for the four four to one match. So we have a total of six middle school SROs. Six times that 44,000 gives you 264,000 to be paid for by the grant with an approximate total cost for middle school SROs equaling $425,000, which would be a cost to the district of $161,000 per year. So funding for our high school SROs. So during the 22-23 school year was the first time that the state allocated specific funding for high school SROs. So in the past, the state would say that 
you have your 069 or some other state funding that you can pull money from um, to pay for SROs. But this year, they allocated a specific dollar amount for each high school to have an SRO. And that dollar amount was $58,480 per high school for SROs. So we had six. If you multiply that six times, your 58480 it gives you $350,880 to be paid for by the state with an approximate cost for high school SROs being $480,000 with a total cost to the district for high school SROs being $129,120 per year. So SRO funding that is not covered by a grant or money specifically allocated for high school SROs will come from state 069 at risk of lot. So the estimated cost of 069 during the 22-23 school year is approximately $291,468.66. Again, this number is not an exact number, but this is an estimation. The estimated total cost from 069 during the 22, uh, excuse me, 2023 2024 school year be $513,120. Without the specified high school SRO and grant funding, the estimated cost of six high school, six middle school, and eight, ele eight elementary school SROs from 069 during the 23 24 school year would be. $1,480,000. So just some of the school safety measures that we have in place um, coming up for the 23-24 school year. Um, we have cameras in all of our schools. Those cameras are located on the outside, the exterior and interior of our buildings. We have access control doors at the main entrances of all of our buildings, all exterior doors are locked during the school day. We have SROs in our schools. There are safety drills, which include fire, lockdown, tornado, and tabletop exercises that our schools have to follow through with. There's a Say Something Anonymous reporting app. We also are um, hopefully going to get the EVOP weapons detection system up and going for the 23-24 school year. We have school safety plans completed in the school risk management plan website. Uh, we have a district safety team, and we also have the emergency red panic button. One thing that is not listed here is that we uh, have a very robust risk assessment. Um, that's for students, students who have threat to themselves or, or harm to others, and mental health protocols, processes, and services within our school district. Uh, we have been working um, on the risk assessment process for approximately eight to nine years now. And we have been involved with the school-based mental health and focusing on SEL for our students over the past four to three years with, with the focus of trying to have school-based mental health um, services and processes in place for all of our schools. So we are fortunate enough in the 30 schools that we have in Nash County Public Schools, all of them have school-based mental health services. Are there any questions for me? Yes, ma'am. Do you decide uh, city police or county or a combination of those? We have a combination. So for our schools located within the city limits of Rocky Mountain, uh, Rocky Mountain Police Department serves those schools, and the Nash County uh, Sheriff Department serves the schools that's located within the county. What about this school? This would be right in our police department. Any other questions? Thank you. So this time we're going to discuss some of the funding challenges that we're going to be facing. Broken them down into demand, the merger impact, teacher retention. What we're going to 
to speak of now is about the budget request, what we're going to be asking for based on these needs, the D merger impact, the recruitment, retention bonus, non certified local supplement, the technology refresh plan. The hell I knew you were first about the Anytime the state of North Carolina decides to give a raise, that's wonderful for state employees and stuff, but it also has a direct impact on our local budget in that we pay supplements to help uh, supplement these salaries to keep qualified people here in our area. Um, but that also affects, you know, our, our, affects our local budget, affects our federal budget, because the, fed, the raises that are then given to federal employees, the federal funding has to support those uh, those increases and those raises and the federal the federal grants also pay for their uh, their bonuses and supplements. But whenever the state gives bonuses to uh, give salary increases, excuse me, to uh, to the employees, it has a direct impact on our on our local budget. As I mentioned, um, you'll see here as I mentioned before, certified teachers, certified principals, uh, classified employees. We estimated five percent. Bus drivers at six and a quarter. And as I did mention to you earlier, Social Security will remain the same. Our match is 7.65%. Our retirement has increased 0.12%. And our hospitalization went up $222 per employee. And to remind you what that plan looks like, go to this next slide. As you can see, the devices for our pre-K through first grades, they will be refreshed every four years. And the reason for this is those particular devices are grade specific, so they stay in that grade level. Our second grade, fifth grade, and ninth grade will receive new devices every year annually. And they will keep those devices for up to four years. And the reason we did this, we mapped those devices to the years of warranty. That makes sense. Uh, we also did not forget about our staff members. We have about roughly maybe 19, 1,800, maybe to 1,900 staff members. So the plan is to refresh a quarter of their devices uh, every year as well. And I think that equals up to maybe around 450 devices per year. Uh, the cost to maintain such a refresh plan is about $1.5 million. Now, we utilize the ESSA funding to support this plan, but however, uh, as Ms. Wallace uh, stated earlier, the particular ESSA funding that we were using is uh, set to expire this December. Okay? So we will need to secure a funding source to support our refresh plan. And as the technology progresses, uh, it's my priority to make sure that our students, our staff, uh, have the most updated devices and the best technology so that they're able to do their work and also to get the best instruction. So are there any questions for me? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to lose the somewhat, but what happens to the third, fourth, sixth, seventh grade? Okay, when you are, let's, let's focus on second grade. When I'm a second grade, I get a new device. 
I stay for you to get four years. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Are we good? Yeah, one more.
refresh plan would be $1.5 million. The local supplement not certified would be $500,000. The benefits additional would be four hundred and fifty, dollars which would be about $2.95 million request for next year. This would give us a total Hearing none, all in favor, please let me know by the sign of aye. 